Evoke Media, I'm Sabrina Mirage Naim. With me is Cassia Binkowski, and this is Breaking Glass, a series of conversations with women around the world who are shattering glass ceilings and challenging social norms. They are audacious, gutsy, and their stories are echoed across borders and generations in a rallying cry that is changing the narrative for women everywhere. Before we jump into our conversation today, I want to share an exciting exclusive event our Evoke Media team has been working on. You may recall one of our first episodes features Irish civil rights activist Alva Smith and the documentary she's featured in, The Eighth. This beautifully made film tracks the grassroots fight to overturn one of the most restrictive abortion bans in the world. In advance of The Eighth's official U.S. release, we're hosting an exclusive event on July 13th that you are invited to. You'll have access to watch the film and join us for a timely and pivotal discussion on July 13th at 12.30 p.m. Pacific, 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Snag your spot at weareevokemedia.com. Today's conversation takes us to San Diego, California, where we're speaking with Chrissy Powers. Chrissy is a wife, a mom, a marriage and family therapist, a podcast host, and a writer. And while we could dive into any one of those topics, today's conversation is all about sex. To be clear, it's actually about the messy intersection of sex and religion, which is way juicier. This is a topic we've been wanting to talk about for a long time, and one we're really excited to unpack with Chrissy. Yes, Sabrina. And more specifically, we're talking about Chrissy's upbringing in the evangelical Christian church and the pressure she experienced to be pure, to save herself for marriage. She's unpacking everything from the sex talks she had with her father, the shame she felt around her own body, to the purity agreement that she signed, and the mental health issues she struggled with as a young adult. Sex was tied up in all of that. And now as a therapist, Chrissy is reflecting on purity culture and our relationship to sex and pleasure as both wives and as women. Take a listen. Hi, Chrissy. Thank you so much for joining us. We're excited to have you. Thank you so much. We are really interested in having this conversation, um, mostly because we've been wanting to talk about sex and sexuality for a long time, but the context, I think, of this conversation um, shines a light on female sexuality in in a way that is kind of a a unique angle, and I'm really interested in exploring that a little bit, um, mostly from your background, your upbringing, And I think it's really relatable for a lot of people. So I want to start the conversation by having you read an excerpt from your blog, if you would. Um, You recently wrote a post titled Pleasure and Purity. Um, Please read the first paragraph for us and set the stage for this conversation. Yes. Okay. It's 1997. I was an impressionable 13-year-old sitting in youth group at church, feeling the weight of the world on my shoulders. We were learning about the sacredness of sex and how all good Christians wait to have it until they are married. We signed a purity agreement, wore our rings, and took pride in our decision to remain pure. I'm still proud I didn't give myself away to any Joe Schmo, but I'm not, I'm just now learning that there were negative effects of carrying that much pressure. So I, I, this blog was the reason why we wanted to really have this conversation with you in addition to your extensive experience and background as a family and marriage therapist, but really it was your personal experience that drew us into wanting to kind of peel back the layers of your experience growing up. So paint us a picture of your childhood. What was your family's relationship to religion growing up? Yeah. Um, very religious, very evangelical Christian. Um, the church I went to was very small. It was like a family, um, which I loved. I loved the community part of it. I loved feeling like I belonged to a group. Um, but it was, you know, there was a lot of pressure to be, um, to be some perfect perfect girl, I guess I would say. Um, and my dad was actually one of the pastors at the church. So there was additional pressure to, um, be a perfect family and to not ever do anything wrong that would shame my parents. Um, so 
that was my upbringing. I, and I say it <laughs> with like, I see the pressure now as an adult doing work, doing uh, emotional work. Um, but as a child, it was idyllic in a sense. But the work I do as a therapist now, I really go back and learn how anxiety uh, can grow into an, adulthood from the pressures that we put on children. And so a lot of that anxiety that I have now, I believe kind of grew like a little in a Petri dish of perfectionism um, and expectation. Uh, I, I by no means would say that I had a horrible childhood at all. I had like one of the best ones. I still have an amazing relationship with my parents, uh, but it's grown. And it's, it's because of that, that I have a good relationship with them. Um, and my faith has grown. I have not departed from faith. I've had to deconstruct things that I learned as a child that no longer serve me as an adult though. So we're going to get into all of these things. Um, and we're excited to dive into them. I'm curious how much power, how much influence did religion have over how you were parented, the messages you were receiving about what was right and wrong, what was expected of you? How much did that come from the church? Yeah, I feel like religion did play a big part in our upbringing and parenting, my parents' parenting. Um, I would say 90% of it, but I feel like I had the rebellious parents that were like, no, we're going to give our kids experiences and we're not going to homeschool them. And once they got into the church program, parenting program, it was called Growing Kids God's Way. They were like, what is this? We're not doing this with our kids. Like, but a lot of parents did um, in that, in our church and in that, you know, community. So, um, I feel like I did have really conscious parents for the most part, um, which wasn't really a thing back then in the eighties and nineties. Conscious parenting just wasn't wasn't a thing. It was very authoritarian, very much I said so, do this because I said so. So what was available to them was very limited. And I think that's an important frame to, to put on this conversation, right? Is, um, you know, I think every parent is doing the best they can with what they have um, and the community that they're in and the messages that they're receiving. And um, so this is in no way to discredit anybody's approach. It's, um, you know, the, the community that they were a part of. I want to take this right into the heart of the conversation now, which is about sex. Um, and admittedly, it's really hard for me to, to take myself back to age 13 and try to remember what I knew or didn't know about sex. And I grew up in a house where we didn't, my parents never had the formal talk with us. Like they were available to us if we had questions, but there was never a formal sit down um, that happened. What messages were you receiving and hearing at home with regards to sexuality and intimacy? I mean, we started the conversation with that your experience at the church um, and signing this purity agreement, which we'll get into. But what, how were these being reiterated at home? What were you seeing modeled for you? I remember my brother getting the sex talk um, because he got to go to my dad's office and there were these tapes, these cassette tapes, like a whole book of them. And I was like, so intrigued. I was like, what are you guys doing back there? And my dad was like, and my mom and dad were like, this is not for you yet. Like, this is, you know, Josh's time to, you know, learn about something. I was like, okay. So I knew it was something like special, um, because they got this time away with my dad and it was these tapes. I'm sure it was probably from focus on the family of what to listen to and how to tell someone about, you know, a boy about sex. Um, when it came to my turn <laughs> to learn about it, I was in fifth grade and I had heard from a friend at school and I was so curious and I came home and I said, mom, is this really how babies are made? And she's like, okay, I guess it's time to tell you. <laughs> so she sat me down and she, fifth grade is pretty young. That's what, 10 years old. Yeah. Okay. That was about 10. Yeah. I was really confused. It, so it was kind of in steps, I think, but, um, she told me around, yeah, at that time, this is how, you know, babies are made and this is, you know, it's, it's for marriage. 